I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. As we conclude our series on spiritual warfare and the armor of God specifically, we come to the final verses of Ephesians 6. We will read verse 10 through verse 20. This is the word of the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever been in a situation where you might be visiting with a friend or a family member and they're sharing something with you, a certain event in their life, And you don't know how to respond. And so you might say something like, I wish I could do more, but I guess I will, I'll just pray. Just pray. As if that isn't really doing that much. But we are a society of doers and and fixers. And so we want to help and, and we feel that we can't do much And we often then think that praying isn't doing much. So we minimize it. Just pray. We minimize the importance of prayer. We we minimize the, the power of prayer. The power of the Spirit. Today, as we wrap up the the series on the the spiritual warfare and the armor of God specifically, we look at prayer. Paul's letter to the Ephesians is filled with prayer. It just sings with prayer throughout the entire letter. In fact, the first chapter of Ephesians begins with this thanksgiving and praise and prayer. Early on it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul is praying for the Ephesians throughout the entire letter. And as Eugene Peterson describes, prayer is flowing throughout Ephesians and it kind of goes underground after the beginning prayer. Kind of like an underground aquifer where the water is still running underground, but every once in a while it bubbles to the surface. Like in chapter 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then it continues to flow through Ephesians and then it comes up again to the surface as he he wraps up the entire letter with prayer once again. 
And he connects prayer to the armor of God. As you see, as we read, there is no indication of separation between the armor of God and prayer as the language just, language just flows from one to the next. You get a sense from Paul in Ephesians that prayer should be all-encompassing. In verses 18 to 20, we see the word prayer, pray, or request. We see those words six times in those three verses. So for Paul, it's essential. But what does he say about prayer? We will primarily be looking at verse 18. And so if you want to keep it open in front of you, I encourage you to do so. But first Paul says, and pray in the Spirit. We're wrapping up this uh, series on spiritual warfare, and it's quite significant then that as we're talking about spiritual warfare around us, that it's a battle, as Paul says, it's not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle in which we need the Spirit's help because we cannot face it on our own. We need the Spirit to be in us and through us, through all of this process of the the armor of God. Prayer is surrounding every piece of armor. And the Spirit is God's gift to us to help us in this spiritual battle. In the Gospel of John, Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure. He had been with them for about three years and he was knowing he was going to the cross and he would leave them soon and they were concerned and so he's trying to comfort them. He's not going to leave them alone but he was going to send help. He was going to send one to comfort them. Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The word advocate also is translated as comforter. The spirit is there for us. So we can have the presence of God with us wherever we go. As an advocate, he speaks on our behalf to God. As a comforter, he speaks to us on behalf of God, giving us God's truth and the comfort of that we can experience with his presence. Since Jesus is no longer with us physically, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. So we do not experience that absence. So Paul is is critical on needing the Holy Spirit. He says, pray in the Spirit. And in the, the book of Romans, he also talks about the necessity of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 26 and 27, He says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Have you ever had a moment in your life when you're confronted with a situation and you don't know what you are to pray for? I know I have. When I'm walking down the halls of a hospital to an ICU to visit a family who's going through a a severe tragedy, I'm searching and asking God to give me the words to speak, the words to pray, because I know that the words alone, my words will not be enough to make someone feel any better in those moments. Or when you get a phone call from, from a friend that their, their loved one just passed away. Or your family member, you're sitting there in the room with a doctor and they give you this, this diagnosis of cancer and, and you don't know what to say. On the drive home, you don't know what to say and, and often you might not even say anything. We've been there. We've been at those times when we don't know what to say. We don't know what to pray. And so sometimes we need help. 
Yet the Spirit knows. Paul says, He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. What a powerful reminder for us when we don't know what to pray, when we don't know what to say, sometimes we don't say anything. But the Spirit knows. God knows. Dr. Alvin Vandergreen writes in his book, Praying God's Heart, when Paul tells us to pray in the Spirit, he is urging us to pray as the Spirit enables us to pray, or to pray by the power and the direction of the Spirit. In other words, pray in the Spirit is not a command, it's an offer of help. Help that is available for any praying believer, anytime, anywhere. What a great comfort to know. That when we don't know what to say, when we don't have the words to speak, the Spirit knows what to speak for us. We're not praying alone. We're praying with the Spirit's help, the Spirit's direction, the Spirit's guidance. And so we pray with the Spirit's help, and as Paul continues, we pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So what does that mean from Paul here? Is he telling us that we should be praying all the time, as he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, to pray continually? What does it mean to pray continually, to pray on all occasions? Eugene Peterson says in his book, Practice Resurrection, not all prayers are conscious. Not all prayers can be identified as prayers. He says, prayer is the language underlying and sometimes surfacing in all our language as we grow up in Christ. Most of us pray a good deal more than we are aware that we are praying. He says, it's not that prayer doesn't involve attentiveness and alertness to God. It's only that it doesn't require a learned skill. He says, trying harder doesn't help. What does he mean? What Peterson is describing is that through the Spirit in us, as we grow in our faith, as we grow in maturity, we learn how we can pray all the time, continually, on all occasions. And sometimes they're not actually words we're speaking out loud, but it's through our thought process that we can be praying in ways we don't even realize we're praying. But sometimes when we think of prayer, we think we need to be eloquent. We need to sound so wonderful, especially if we're in front of other people. And a lot of us don't want to be pressured to pray in public. That's like the scariest thing ever to ask a Dutch reform person. Hey, do you want to pray before the meal here? They'll often, and you know who they're going to point to if I'm there. Some of you have done it, right? But did you know we never once took a class in seminary on how to pray? So you think I'm trained in prayer, but I'm not. In fact, we are all trained in the same way, and it is by praying and practicing on our own. And in fact, some of the most powerful prayers that I've heard are from the non-trained. You see, prayer is powerful because prayer is the Spirit coming through us. It's not something we learn or get better at unless we just pray continually. Vandergreen says that the Spirit guides us in our prayers and practically gives us ways to, to figure out how we are praying if we're not doing the, what we think of praying, is folding our hands, closing our eyes, and speaking out loud. He says, practically, the Spirit helps us by giving you a burden, a deep love or concern for a person or a cause as it weighs on you. You may attend an event where they're raising awareness about a need somewhere, and because of that event and you attending it, all of a sudden you have this burden on your heart and you can't help but but pray for it. 
Or Vander Green says, he might give you an unexpected thought. It might be so sudden you think to yourself, where did that come from? Maybe you've had some of those. Or the Spirit gives you a strong impression, a sense that, he, that He's giving you something to pray for so that He can act in response to your prayer. Or as you're reading Scripture, it might make Scripture come alive as you read it and it comes alive in your heart to the point that you're reminded you should be praying for someone. Now, there are these practical ways that the Spirit helps us, gives us a burden, gives us a thought, it gives us an impression, sometimes reading Scripture. But we have to train ourselves to listen to those and respond and act in prayer. And so we're encouraged to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. He says, with this in mind... Be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Be alert in our prayers. As we're listening to the Spirit working in these thoughts, in these uh, unexpected ideas or Scripture verse, we have to be alert to it and be ready to respond. To pray for all of the Lord's people. But Paul says be alert. And what that makes me think of is when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. He goes and he prays before he is going to the cross. And he prays three times. And each time he comes back and the disciples are asleep. He tells them in Matthew 26 verse 40 and 41. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Spiritual warfare is real, so we need to be alert. Jesus was praying before he was going to be arrested, and some have depicted that scene when Jesus is praying as a spiritual battle that Satan has come and is trying to tempt him once again to try to to get him to come away and not go to the cross. Jesus needed his disciples to be alert, to be praying for him, for his mission. But they kept falling asleep. So we also, in this spiritual battle, need to be alert as we pray. But we also need to be persistent. The New Testament over and over again talks about how we need to be persistent in pray, in praying. Jesus tells us the parable of the persistent widow. And because she is so persistent, she gets justice for her request. Jesus tells the parable of the friend at midnight who goes to his neighbor asking for, for food because he had a visitor come at a late hour. But he is persistent, and so his neighbor helped him. Jesus tells us to ask, to seek, to knock. And what it's actually saying is to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Be persistent. But Vandergreen warns that we don't be persistent as a way of manipulation. He says, God is not pleased with the kind of persistent prayer that attempts to coerce him into doing what we want. We can't make God do anything, and even if we could, we wouldn't want to. He says, the truth is, however, that God is very willing to act, to act in line with our prayers, if our prayers are in line with his will. So we cannot be manipulating God by by pestering him, by being annoying and asking over and over and over again to the point that he'll just give in. Kind of like what toddlers hope their parents will do by repeatedly asking for something. But as Vandergreen highlights, John Calvin taught that prayer was a means by which the power of Satan could be broken and that God's kingdom would be extended. How? He says that in persistence in prayer, we're brought closer 
to God. We can see his accomplished will on earth. By praying in the Spirit, we're aligning ourselves with God's will, and we can see how he is working, even in the situations where we don't get the answer we expect. He says that by being persistent, it moves the persistent prayer towards God. Because you're drawing yourself closer to God by praying and repeatedly going back to Him. So you're deepening that relationship. And he also says that by being persistent in prayer, it brings us face to face with our own weakness and frailties. Because when we pray, we see we cannot do it on our own. That sometimes we are driven to our knees and we're crying out to God, asking for his help. Paul, who is praying in this prayer and is even asking for prayers. As it says, he's an ambassador in chains. As he's writing this letter, he is in prison because of what he is doing, spreading the gospel. So he recognizes that it's a spiritual battle, that he too needs prayer. And he's encouraging us to pray for each other, to pray for our leaders, to pray for those sharing the gospel message. Because we need God and the Spirit to help us as we cannot face Satan alone. There are many times, however, when Satan tries to get us to doubt, to doubt the efficacy of prayer. Now I want to share a story with you about my own struggles with prayer. Wondering if prayer is effective or not. Now, I already shared this story with Ken and Ramona Braun the other night, asking if I could share it here. You see, on Friday, Ken and Ramona celebrated a milestone that some people don't get to celebrate. The milestone was one year ago on Friday, March the 5th, Ken had a massive heart attack while driving his truck in a steel yard in Regina. A heart attack that really, he probably shouldn't have survived. Yet the loader operator was right behind him, saw him go off the road and was able to go help. There were EMTs who were trained, who worked at that steel plant, were able to get to him quickly. When I went to see Ken in the hospital that weekend, and I told him this now, that I thought for sure I would be doing a funeral in a few days. There had just been too many situations in my my own career, in my young career, that I actually didn't have any hope or put much stock into God answering our prayer. And in fact, I prayed to God at some point that weekend, a very selfish prayer. I remember praying, God, I need a miracle. I wasn't asking for a miracle for Ken. I was asking for a miracle for myself because I was becoming callous to these situations and events and began to doubt if God even answered our prayers. I looked at Ken in the hospital and I heard all that they were doing for him and I didn't expect him to recover, even though I prayed. Now, I didn't say this to Ken and Ramona the other night, but sometimes I wonder, did God save Ken to restore confidence in my prayer life. Now, I know there are many other reasons why God probably chose to save Ken's life, but I know for me what it did is he answered my prayer in needing a miracle. But that's the difficult part of prayer. God doesn't always give us that miracle that we're asking for. We may never see the results that we want, but God is still working through those prayers. He's working in our life in some way. He's working through those prayers. And that's where it's a mystery. That's where we need the Spirit to help us when we are weak and we don't know what to say. The Spirit is speaking for us, interceding for us. Paul tells us to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of requests. And as we grow in maturity in our faith, 
We begin to experience the Spirit's leading and directing, sometimes nudging us to pray for certain things. Calling us to be persistent, to be alert. So we can be encouraged because as we're persistent, of all things, we're drawing closer to God as He wants us to come to Him. We may not see how God is working in prayer. But in some way, by drawing us closer to himself, by allowing us to see his work, and bringing us to the realization that we need his help, God is working. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Shall we pray? Almighty God and gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to pray, to pray through the Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your Spirit coming to intercede for us, to give us words that we cannot speak ourselves. Lord, there are many times when we struggle with prayer, with wondering if it's effective or not. But Lord, we see that by continually praying and drawing close to you, we begin to see how you are working. We can see that you are drawing us closer to yourself. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to use your Holy Spirit in that way. As we grow and mature in our faith, that we may Follow the promptings of the Spirit, the nudging, the pushing that you might do. And Lord, let us never give up. Let us see your mighty hand at work, your answers to prayer in many different ways. Help us to see that through your Spirit. And we pray this through the Spirit. Amen.